today, Saturday morning. Um, this is a real pleasure, too, for me to be here talking about one of my favorite topics, as Jeff said. Um, Jeff said, I'm, I'm a member of North Star Church. Um, my wife is here, Stephanie, and my two kids, uh, Austin, who's in fourth grade, and Anna in fifth grade. I'm not sure where she got it right now. Um, so, we, uh, we moved here to Blackbird uh, about four years ago, and um, not affiliated with the university, believe it or not, but uh, I work for a company in the CRC, and um, love to study the Bible, love to study um, history of the faith, church history, uh, manuscript history of the Bible, and anything, anything apologetics. I love to read the Bible first and foremost, but... Uh, I like to do other studies as well. So, you know, today is, um, I'm not really going to go over a lot of history. That's not my point. But um, my hope is that when you leave here today, you know, my, my prayer for you is that you leave here with a greater awareness of God in your everyday life and in your relationships with other people. Um, even some of the inner thoughts that you have as a person, uh, you know, can be evidence of God. I've met a lot of people that I've talked to that, you know, that had told me that I just don't feel God in my life. I pray, but I don't feel like God answers my prayer. I don't really feel like He's there. Am I, am I, is He listening to me? And I believe that God has put something in us when we're born that allows, that allows us to sense His presence. But since we've always had it, I think sometimes we take it for granted. You know, His presence being here. You know, we we there may be evidence in our lives of God, and we we just gloss over. And what I want to do is try to highlight those things today. You know, when you see people, when you see two people argue, for example, you listen to what they say. You'll hear a lot of common themes, a lot of common statements. And there there is evidence of God in our life today. And I want to bring that out. The other thing I want to bring out is I would like. It's important that our faith be not just emotional, but it be intellectual too. And we don't, you know, it's not good to have a blind faith. Don't believe just because your parents believe or you grew up in a church. Make a good decision, a good rational decision yourself, and be convinced of your faith. So that's a part of the theme as well. So we'll get started. Um, I think you're really going to enjoy this. I did. I tried hard to keep this entertaining and captivating, and. Uh, um, I pray that it's a blessing. I pray the Spirit is here and that He speaks, not just me, but that the truth be spoken today. So we'll get started here. So we'll start off with uh, part one. I hope everyone has a handout. If you don't have a handout, we have lots of handouts. Just raise your hand and my son will give you a handout. Um, we'll start off with part one. Uh, is talking about, um, about not being afraid of asking the hard questions. Um, you know, this first part is, have you, have you ever asked yourself difficult questions about the Bible's claim of the nature of God? You know, have you ever read the Bible and really asked hard questions? Some people are afraid of that. Do you fear that? And have you ever felt guilty about having doubts? Can being honest about our struggles with certain beliefs be beneficial to our faith? Have you ever had doubts? Raise your hand. Who's had doubts about their faith? <laughs> I think we probably all do if you're a believer. But you should know that you're not alone. And doubts can be scary. You know, what am I doing? Why am I believing what I believe? And the Bible's clear. You know, the Bible, God doesn't want us to have doubts. The ultimate goal is not doubt, right? And there's clear scripture about that. But it's a reality of us as fallen human beings that there will be times we may have doubt. But don't ignore it. The, the message is don't ignore your doubts. Explore that, and that will come. I think the Lord will bless you and help you with your doubts. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, and it leads into the big question. Should the Christian faith be a blind faith? How many people do you know that will just get stuck on that level, and they don't want to look at or consider what the world offers them? It's, it's, it's prevalent. And I don't, think it's, I don't think that God wants us to have a blind faith. I think God wants us to have... A reason, faith, a decision. Make a decision. Make a real decision by examining. Examine what the world offers us. You know, 
have some, have some knowledge of what the other religions of the world are and make a decision for Christ. You know, and be convinced of that decision and have a basis for your decision. Because the Bible is also clear that he wants us to give a defense if we're asked for our faith. So we must have a good rational decision and that rational basis for our faith. It should be a well-reasoned evidential faith. Now we've all read one of the most famous verses in the Bible. This, there's something in this verse that really I want to highlight and stand out. Matthew 22 says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. You ever pick that out with all your mind? It's easy to gloss over those clauses in that sentence. But God wants us, He wants us not just to have an emotional faith, He wants us to have an intellectual faith. Love the Lord with your mind. That's an intellectual argument, right? So that's what the greatest commandment is. We should do that. Biblical evidence of God encouraging belief through evidence. Can anyone name anything like that? Can you think of any examples where the Bible talks about the importance or gives the, the importance of an evidential-based faith? In Acts 1-2, here's one example. It says, Luke wrote, Until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering, and here's the key, by many proofs appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. So when Jesus rose from the dead, he came back and he gave many proofs. Why did he do that? Because he wants you to believe. He wants to give evidence. He wants you to have a good reason, rational argument for your faith. He's giving proofs. Let's examine the evidence in our lives today. Of course, I wish Jesus would come here in the flesh and give me stuff too. But, wow. You know, I like to think, for myself anyway, you know, when Jesus died, this is sort of a side topic, when Jesus died on the cross, that was the payment, right? That was the payment for our sin. When Jesus rose from the dead, that was the receipt. It was the receipt for that. It was him come back and say, here's proof. Here's proof to the world that I conquered death. Here's proof that I conquered sin. And he came back for... for one reason is to show everybody, look, I am who I am. I really did die for you, and I really am God. In Acts 17, Luke writes further, And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbaths day, he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and providing and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead. For the, the very first early days of the church, Paul was going to the, to the synagogues and he was reasoning from the scripture. He was looking at prophecy and he was making an intellectual argument to people that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus was the Messiah who was predicted. Again, reasoning from proof. The message is be convinced. Let's be convinced about what we believe. Why? Because Throughout our lives, we're going to run into times of doubt, and we need to be convinced. We're going to run into folks who are going to challenge our faith, that's going to read something or have some objection, and we want to be prepared, and we want to be strong in our spirit. The spirit will help us, not only to be strong in the spirit, but the spirit will give us the words to say, especially if we're, if we're, um, if we're walking with the spirit every day. He will help us through some of those challenging times. I've seen Christians just crumble when they're not prepared and they get some, they hear something difficult or challenging from someone. And that's, you know, it's okay to be nervous, but that's also the, one of the things we want to try to avoid as best as we can. In Romans 1, 15, 5, Paul says, each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. 2 Timothy 1 says, but I am not ashamed, for I know whom I believe, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Be ready to make a strong defense of your faith. Very popular verse, uh, many of you know, 1 Peter 3.15. Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. So one of the roles of, a, one of, the roles of apologetics is to help with this. To have something to share with somebody that that would be an intellectual argument. 
You know, there's a faith argument and there's also an intellectual argument. Faith reinforced by reason. Since he made us rational beings, we must first examine the choices in life and claims about God to make a rational decision for him. You ever thought about that? I mean, we all know we're rational beings. Why did God make us rational beings? Why did God give us choices, the ability to make, to reason? And I think one of the key reasons is he wants us to make a rational decision for him. And when we make a decision for him, based, uh, that, that then we can be convinced. But, but again, we all have doubts. And where do they lead us? Many people of faith experience questions of God and of faith. And it is true in the Bible, there's a few places, I put one of them here, where God encourages to have faith and to not doubt. One of them here is in Matthew 21, he says, Jesus says, Truly I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what, has, what was done to that fig tree, but also you can say to the mountain, Go throw yourself in the sea and it will be done. So the ultimate goal is to not have doubts, but doubts is a reality of our Christian walk as we, as we mature in our faith. But don't ignore your doubts. Seek God's help with your doubts, and He will help you overcome them and grow in spiritual maturity. There's examples in the Scripture where Jesus um, helps you help someone with their doubt. And a really good example is Thomas. When Thomas had doubts about the resurrected Lord, Jesus encouraged Thomas to believe. He said, believe. And He showed Himself as proof. Stood there in the flesh. The key point is that Jesus responded to Thomas' request for more evidence. Remember Thomas said, I want to touch his hand. I want to put my hand in his side. He asked for evidence, and Jesus showed up and said, I give you this evidence right now. And I believe that if you say that prayer, you know, as this next one says, when one of the demon-possessed sons, Jesus healed, I love the innocence of this prayer. He said, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When we cry out to God, we're honest with God about doubts we may have, struggles we have spiritually. I believe that just as Jesus came and showed evidence to Thomas when he requested it, I think he will also do the same for you. And I think it, it works through relationships and circumstances in your life, but I believe that God responds to that prayer. So what, what is the whole point? Where does all this lead us? Well, as we examine the evidence for God, we'll grow in, in spiritual maturity. As we mature more, we will have a greater awareness of God's existence. And a big part of this presentation is going to focus on that. Awareness of God's existence in our life today. But holding His glory in simple everyday events, I think we ignore those things and gloss over them. I want to try to pull those out today. It increases if we, you know that, you ever thought about that? If we feel and sense God and see God in our life in this world, that it will motivate us to serve. It will motivate us to serve. The ultimate goal is enriched worship. I believe that we can have an incredible spiritual worship if we really have that sense of God's presence in our life. It's hard to worship when you don't. If you don't feel God's there, it's hard to get into it, right? Overcoming doubts and examining the evidence of our faith leads to a stronger awareness of God's presence and to His glory. So since we talked about a little bit of apologetics, apologetics is a huge topic. It doesn't even have to be Christian apologetics. There's all kinds of apologetics. You know, apologetics are many different topics. There's Hinduism apologetics. There's all kinds of apologetics. But what is their role? I mean, obviously we're talking about Christian apologetics. I'm an engineer. I have a hard time not getting technical. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm going to try... <laughs> Doing my best here, so I just put the warning out there. Christian, what we're talking about is a Christian apologetics. It is, Christian apologetics is the reason, argument, and justification for our faith. Simple as that. But even within Christian apologetics, there's a lot of sub-discipline in there. It comes in many different varieties. Some of them are historical, looking at you know, the, tr you know, the truths of the Bible, the stories. Did they really happen? Did Jesus really die on the cross? You know, did he really rise from the dead? You know, where was he buried? Those sort of things, historical apologetics. It's a whole huge field. People make careers out of that. Another area of apologetics is defense of miracles. Were they real? How could that happen? 
You know, is this some natural event? Can it be explained just through lack of understanding at the time? Are they real? You know, defense of miracles is a field <coughs> project. Oh, the other part is do miracles happen today? A whole other area. Prophetic fulfillment. Did Jesus really fulfill the prophecies? Philosophical apologetics. Somewhat what we're talking about today. Creationist apologetics. We'll also hit on that today. But what's the use? What's the point of apologetics? Think of apologetics as a tool. It is useful, but this tool is interesting. It's useful for the believers and the un unbelievers. I've ran into people before that think apologetics is just an evangelism tool. I don't think that's true. I think it is an evangelism tool, but I think it's useful for believers. So what does it do for a believer? For a believer, apologetics helps us to be well-grounded in our faith to provide evidence of faith for examination purposes, to support us in articulating the hope that is in us, hence the first Peter chapter 3 verse, and to defend the true Christian faith against objections. As we see and read objections, apologetics is a tool that will help us defend the true faith and prevent us from heresies, quite honestly. But it's also a tool for unbelievers. Apologetics is useful to support evangelism to unbelievers by providing evidence, both historical and present, today we focus mostly on present, of God's existence and to the truth of the death and the resurrection of His Son, Jesus. God calls people to seek Him and come to faith using a variety of means. God may use apologetics as a tool to bring someone to faith, or He may not. You know, I've also met people, I work with one person in particular, who is really, really in apologetics and almost feels like that's how God calls people all the time. And I, I don't believe that. I think it's, it's more useful for some people than it is for others. But I think it's a tool. I also don't put such faith in apologetics to think that it, it's, like an, it's not like an equation. It's not like it proves beyond any possible doubt of every single thing that you read in the Bible. It's not like that. I think it's useful. I think it gets people so far. I think apologetics is also helpful when, when the Lord is calling someone that it could help someone take that final step into faith. You know, it could be that final straw. But it's a tool, and it's a useful tool, but it's not everything. It's not the only tool that God uses. I wish I had time to go into my own story. I got saved as an adult. It was about six months after I, we were married. So I was married as a non-Christian. Non and apologetics played a very, very minor role with me, which is strange because apologetics seems to be very useful for engineer types. But for me, it wasn't so much. But that's a whole other story. I wish I had more time to go into that and tell my story. But um, I got saved in 1998. So it's been a long time now, but I was clearly an adult when I was saved. Apologetics of what we experience. In this presentation, I largely cover an area of apologetics that looks at the world around us today as evidence of God's existence. It's easy to look back at historical evidence and you, you read a lot about that kind of stuff, you know, like biblical archaeology magazines and all that kind of stuff. But I don't hear a whole lot about what is the evidence in front of us every day as we're alive today. Where can I look for God? And that's why my heart was turned towards this subject today. I wanted to present this for that reason. Evidence of God, we'll look at evidence of God in our relationships with one another. Evidence of God in human behavior. Evidence of God within ourselves. The main point is God's divine nature can be perceived. And he says that he is perceived by all men. Romans chapter 1 says, For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. And I believe this wholeheartedly, this is true, that God has revealed himself, his invisible attributes, his eternal power in our lives, each and every one of us. We'll move on to another, another section, and just as a disclaimer, a lot of what remains of this part of the presentation, it outlines a, one of my favorite books in your Christianity um, uh, by C.S. Lewis with some additional content that I threw in there. Um, 
So, if, and I encourage you, if you want to do further study, I recommend that book highly, Your Christianity. Wonderful, wonderful book. So let's talk about what happens when people argue. Two, pe two people arguing. What are some things that what are some things that you hear a lot of times when you hear people when you see people argue? Or if you're in an argument, anybody want to give an example? What are some things you hear? You're not hearing me. You're not hearing me. Well, this is stupid. Stupid. You're stupid. <laughs> You're wrong. You're wrong. It's good. Common things. It's good. Anybody else? All right, I did put some examples up here that I thought of. How would you like to be treated that way? That's a common thing you hear. How would you like to be treated that way? Or how about, go to the back of the line. I was here first. Go to the line. You promised, and now you won't take me to the movies. You said you were going to take me, and now you won't go. I hear that from my kids before. <laughs> Common things that you hear. One thing you notice is that the injured person, the person upset the most, he doesn't. that person doesn't appeal to merely his own preferences, but to a universal standard of behavior or morality to which both parties agree. So like if you take the example, how would you like to be treated that way? Isn't that argument really getting at the point that that um, that do unto others as you would want someone to do unto you? A universal truth that we all want to feel. We all feel that way. It's, it's ingrained in human nature, right? Or that second one, go to the back of the line for I was here first. Isn't that really getting at the universal truth that it's not right to put yourself first at the expense of another person? That this, everyone agrees with that. You promise, and now you won't take me to the movies. Keeping your word, being a person of integrity. The inevitable question is, well, where does that come from? If we all share it, where does that universal truth come from? Anybody want to answer that? <laughs> right, yell it out. <coughs> where does that come from? Where do we get that from? Come on, Adele. You know. Gosh. <laughs> I get to pick on you because you brought that bottle in. Yeah, well, I can do it again. Oh, man. <laughs> it's a good thing I ate a long time ago because I'm glad you're over there and I don't have to stay out the whole time. <laughs> I've picked on her before about her ball of whatever. It comes from God, and we're going to talk about that. You notice that when people argue that no one appeals to a different standard of morality, you never hear someone say to heck with your standard. They might say that you're distorted or that... I have greater morality than you. You might hear things like that. But you never hear someone argue from the standpoint of let's, let's argue against the universal standard. It just doesn't even make sense. And you, how can you win an argument like that? More likely, what's the more likely approach? The more likely approach is that a person tries to make the case that he didn't actually violate the standard. Now we're talking about the person being yelled at. Right? Isn't that what they're going to do? They're going to try to say, let's say my wife is yelling at me claiming that I did something wrong. <coughs> what am I likely to respond? I'm likely to respond in a way to try to make the case that I really, I really didn't violate the standard, or maybe I have an excuse for violating it this one time. That's what you hear in general, right? It's, it's common to appeal to some special excuse why he should violate the standard this one time. Maybe this one time. There may be a reason for it, right? What are some common excuses given in an argument to justify bad behavior? Can you think of any other examples? To justify it. What was, do you hear? I was hangry. <laughs> <laughs> well, didn't have time. <coughs> ran out of time. That's true. Mm -hmm. Hear that a lot. You did it first. Ah, oh, <laughs> that's a, that's a, I didn't think about that one. That's true. That's the, you hear that a lot. <laughs> Not hurting anyone. Not hurting anyone. Oh, I didn't hurt anybody else. No one, no one else was involved. It was just me. It's true. <laughs> I love this picture. If you look close, there's a this is a kangaroo boxing this guy. <laughs> but the truth is, is that if we didn't have a universal standard of morality that we all share we wouldn't likely be arguing verbally, we'd be fighting. What we would have is total chaos. If we had no universal 
idea of what good behavior is. Wouldn't we all just physically just fight in a total brawl? Because you would have no standard to argue. So we would fight like animals. We'd be like animals <coughs> if there was no agreement about a standard of fair play or behavior. Instead, what we see is that people quarrel. Probably 99% of the time when there's an argument, all you really see is people quarrel. What is quarreling? Quarreling is trying to argue that the other person is wrong. Fundamentally, that's what you're doing, right? You were wrong. You did something to violate the universal standard. There is no, but there is no sense in arguing unless both agree as to what right and wrong are. Isn't that true? You rarely see people, sometimes you see people fist fight. Most of the time people just quarrel. But who is it that quarrels? Well, all people quarrel. It doesn't matter what, how old you are. It doesn't matter whether you're educated or not educated. Everybody quarrels because everybody shares that, that standard of decent behavior. Our universal standard of morality is often simply called the laws of nature, in fact, because it has been understood to be universal. It's found among all peoples transcends time, and it's innate in our core nature. And you've probably heard that, natural law. Isn't that what all of our, or most of our legal laws are based upon? Based upon natural law that we all agree, universal standard. It is something taught to us, but we have it, it is not something taught to us. Our parents may teach us manners, but we have it in our core. We're all born with that sense. So the inevitable question, I don't know why I'm getting this notice. An inevitable question is, how did people come to have a universal morality by default? How did that happen? Anybody have any thoughts on that? Can you think of any example in the Bible that would clue us in as to how we got this sense of, as a rational being, and universal standard morality, anything particularly in the Old Testament. Is there any, any scripture you can think of that, that says, aha, this is where God instilled it in us? Where did we, when did we get it? Anybody? I think at creation, like when he says he created us in his image. Yes. God created us in his image. And I think God put a little bit of himself in us, in our nature, so that we can commune with him, we can seek him, but he also made us rational beings because God is a rational being. And I think it was there that says clearly, this is how we've got to be how we are. It comes from God. One of my favorite Americans, George Washington. I had to put him up there. Um, morality that transcends time. If you notice, earlier, we talked about it transcends age, education level, and time. So what are some examples of things, of questions of morality that have always been true, even if you look back at manuscript history of all civilizations over time? It has always been considered wrong to run away from battle. Look, there's been wars for a long, long time. And what you see common is that when you run away from battle, it's always considered cowardice. It's always a negative, right? Universal. This is one example. How about double-cross others who have been good to you? You pay someone evil and they paid you good. There's always been wrong over time. Putting yourself before somebody else. Can you think of any other examples? Pre premeditated murder. Premeditated murder. Always been wrong. I've heard people say, well, there's cases... I've heard rebuttals. People say, well, you know, a long time ago, people had multiple wives. Well, we don't do that anymore. But you notice that it's always been wrong to have any woman you want. Right? There's change. There are differences in cultures, but it's never been okay to just have any woman you want. Maybe there was a plurality of marriage. So you can still see that universal standard even in cases like that. I say that from a very masculine point of view. <laughs> Women can't have any man they want. Ancient and modern civilizations have all shared the same core understanding of proper behavior and laws of nature. What worldview best explains this? 
you think of all the worldviews out there, all the things the world presents to us, what best explains how we have this sense of morality that was not taught to us? And I'm going to get into some of the arguments that people take against this, and I'm going to talk about that. All right, but I tried my best to not make this too one-sided. I wanted to make this, <coughs> we want to be reasonable. I talk about this, make rational decisions for God, and in that spirit, I do bring up some objections that people make, particularly unbelievers, and I'm going to address some of those in a minute. Of course, none of us keep the laws of nature all the time. We often fail at its vulnerable moments. When we're strong and it's sunny and, and the sun is on our skin and it feels good, we're strong. But we always have vulnerable moments for humans. And it's often at those times that we fail and that we, we fail to live up to the universal standard. A common excuse, I was tired. Excuse for making a mistake. Ooh, this is a bad one. I was feeling lonely. They walk out of cases, but out. I was feeling lonely. I was on a long business trip. All right, I'm going to be <laughs> When caught, we often string out a bunch of excuses, right? We string out a bunch of excuses. Very common. Our excuses point out how very deeply we believe in a law of decency. You ever thought about that? It doesn't matter if you're a believer or an unbeliever in God, that the fact that we all give excuses, it really is evidence in itself that we all share a common law of decent behavior. If we didn't share that universal law of decent behavior, why would we make so many excuses? <coughs> now here's the corollary of that. What about when we do things that are right? What about when we do good? Do we make excuses for that? Usually we don't. Usually we take the credit for it. Yeah, it was me, you know. <laughs> or like maybe inside you think that way, right? But isn't that, isn't that funny how when we make mistakes, we make all these excuses, it wasn't, I, it wasn't my fault. I didn't, you know, I didn't know that person was watching. But when we do good, we just take it. Did you get my point there? You know? It's like we know innately that doing good is what we're supposed to do. Can I talk about that? I mean, this is just such a change of subject, but it's not. It's really related. Thomas Jefferson, another great founding father of our country, wrote the Declaration of Independence, of course, and in the, in the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson appealed to God's universal laws of nature as justification for declaring independence from England. Isn't that true? You hear a lot about how America got started, how we're fundamentally got started on the realization of our basic natural rights, that every person born in this world has natural rights, no one has, is allowed to take away. Isn't that the basis, the, the reason, the rationale for our independence? So the truth is, our country was founded on the principle that all people have fundamental natural rights and that they come from, is, from nature's law. And here's the key I want to point out, that Jefferson equates with God's law I think this is significant. All right. The very first, well, the first, the very first sentence of the Declaration reads the following. And this is really long. It's one sentence, believe it or not. It says, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. Separation. I had to read that. When I first read that, I had to read that like four times to understand what he's talking about because my brain just like lost the whole train of thought. But let me paraphrase. What he's saying is that he says, when it comes time when a people declares to the world that we're going to be separate from the country that rules us, it is, and, and based on the justification of nature's law, and of nature's God, that it is expected of the world that we give the reasons for it. That's basically all he's saying, right? But notice he says both laws of nature and of nature's God. I believe that when he wrote that, what he's essentially doing is he's, he's using the, the, uh, the, term, the, the word and nature. I think he's using that as an amplification, not necessarily separate things. Laws of nature's God and of nature's God, it's an amplification of natural law, okay? A reasonable person could think otherwise, because it is the word and. But I believe that he's equating the two, and one of the evidence for that 
was John Quincy Adams. So John Quincy Adams, in a court case in 1841, wrote, in the Declaration of Independence, the laws of nature are announced and appealed to as identical with the laws of nature's God and as the foundation of all obligatory human laws. So he certainly believed it, and that's a quote. So I believe it as well. I believe that he was connected enough through his father to know what the basis of that was. And that's pretty profound. Nature's law is so innate in us that, that even our founders recognized it as being equivalent with God's natural law to us. And that all of our human laws are really based upon those laws. The foundation, natural law is the foundation for all other just laws and is based upon the law of decent behavior that we all share. To equate natural law with God's law is to recognize that our shared sense of justice comes from God himself and is thus evidence that God is real and has given us all a shared sense of morality and justice. So in conclusion of this section, there is a real standard of morality and decency that we all share. How do we know that? Historical evidence says that the law of, decent, of decency transcends times, cultures, and education levels. When we quarrel with one another, we never object to the standard of morality that we all share. We just take it for granted. The question is, what worldview best explains that? I mean, isn't this evidence for God? I mean, how else could it have been that way? Only the existence of a creator God can explain this. There really is no reasonable explanation otherwise. In a little bit, we're going to, now we're going to kind of turn towards some of the objections that some people say about it. How are we doing? Ten forty-five. Everybody good? Anybody need to take a break? You good? Keep going. Good. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So this section that you're just going to talk about, I titled it "Not Just Following the Herd," and that's sort of a play on you may have heard of different instincts, like the herding instincts. You know, they're in the animal. There's, this, there's all kinds of different instincts. One is the herding instincts. You may have heard the, the instinct of self-preservation, um, sexual instincts. There's all kinds of motherly love, right? So we'll talk about some of those. But one of the big objections that people will say to the argument that we're making in this presentation is that isn't our sense of morality really just an instinct? You know, if, if it's in us, and we just talked about it being innate, like we all share it, is, but instincts are innate. So isn't it just an instinct? Is this something that just sort of evolved over time? And we're going to talk about why that cannot be true. And I want to, I want to argue the opposite of that and say it cannot be an instinct. And I'm going to talk about why that is true, why that is so. So first of all, one example, what is a herding instinct? Anybody want to raise their hand? Or you don't have to raise your hand. You can blur it out. What is a herding instinct? Sticking together. Doing what the majority is doing. Yeah, following the herd, doing what, copying other people is true. Anybody else? What about what about protecting each other? When somebody is in hurt, you want to protect that person, right? Isn't that kind of isn't that kind of sound like a herd? You see that too in the animal kingdoms, pretty cool. You know, elephants and all kind of stuff like that happens. You know, so herding instinct is um. Well, I guess the first part is sort of a question. Is our morality, is it the same thing as an instinct that was developed over many years? An instinct, here's sort of the definition. An instinct is an innate impulse or strong desire to certain behavior that we all share. You kind of agree with that definition? It's, something we all, it's innate and, we, and we, we share it and it's a strong like an urge to do something. I know my dog, we have a beagle. We have all kinds of instincts. Some of them are more glorious than others. So what are, what are some examples of human instincts? Do we have instincts? I mentioned a few earlier. Any other you might want to yell at? Well, I think the, the, the fear factor, I mean, that's how they use terrorism, right? Yes. That's a group response to an event. Yeah. 
that kind of kind of reminds me of the instinct of self-preservation. Well, yeah. So here's some examples: motherly love, desire for food, sexual instincts. A hurting instinct may also include a strong desire to help someone in need. You see someone hurt, you may have a natural urge to help that person. That may be an instinct, right? It's kind of a hurting instinct. All right, so let's take this example. Let's say this poor fellow, and I, this is about the worst position I think I could ever imagine being in. He's hanging from a rope from a cliff. His boat is sunk. There's a crocodile in him, and there's a snake at the top of the rope. I mean, how do you get yourself in that situation? It's pretty bad. And let's say you witness this. You're standing nearby, and you see this poor fellow out there. This is you, although he doesn't look anything like me. I'm going to pretend he's me. Okay, this is me. And what is it? What are some things that are likely going through his mind? What would you think about if you saw this? Take out my iPhone and start start the video. <laughs> oh, what a modern answer. I'm not sure what instinct that is. But I, I have to think about that. Viral video. What are some other things you might think about? It? What's your initial thought? He probably won't invite me back. What? How can you help him without endangering yourself? How can you help him without endangering yourself? That's good. He's a goner. So you might have an, you might you might have an urge to help the person. I'm going to call that instinct. I want to help that person because you wouldn't want to be in that. You would want somebody to help you, right? <coughs> but you might also, at the same time, feel this urge to run away. I don't want to be a part of this. I might get hurt. What if I die? You know, wouldn't you wouldn't you feel? Is it unreasonable to think you would feel two things at the same time? I want to help, but I just I could, if I run, no one will see me right now. I get away from it, right? You may feel both urges. Here's another one. How good is the boat? <laughs> okay, it's not looking too good right now. But what the moral law does is it says, I should do instinct A. It's something inside of you. It's like a voice that says, I feel these conflicting desires. But the moral law kind of goes above those instincts and says, I ought to do this, and I should suppress this instinct. I ought to help that person. Even if you don't really want to do it, right? Moral law rides above our instincts. It tells us what we ought to do, not necessarily what we want to do. You see how that's a distinction? It's above the two instincts. The moral law, it encourages one instinct and it discourages another. Our instincts always use for good. Here's another key difference between an instinct and our universal morality. So let's put up a few up here. What do you think? Motherly love, patriotism, <clears throat> sexual impulse, fighting impulse. Think, I want you to think about all four of those. Can you think of situations where they might be used for good and some situations where they might be used for evil? What about patriotism? That might be a more challenging one. What are some examples of patriotism that could be bad? Yes? Well, uh, I think that any, like, I think our patriotism right now, we can, I mean, we can see right now where it's used in a bad way, where it seems like a majority of people in, in certain camps believe that the United States has, you know, the right to be greater than the rest of the world, or the right to abhor to some kind of law that makes U.S. dominate everything. So, but then patriotism can be good because you want to fight understand. for the right to live freely, so. Anybody else? Any other examples? What about Nazi Germany? To be patriotic at that time, would that, would that have been used for good or used for evil? I would say, I would argue more on the evil side. But there are plenty of cases where it can be good. Sexual impulse, obviously. Right? Times where that's good and times where it's bad. Fighting impulse. There might be times when fighting is appropriate. But a lot of times when it's not. Motherly love. Come on, helicopter moms. <laughs> <laughs> you know, motherly love. Usually good. It can be, as probably everyone has experienced some point in their life, can be used for bad. So these are 
examples of what I believe are instincts that can be good and bad at the same time. But the question is, what about morality? What about our universal standard? Is it ever bad? I would argue that it's not. I would argue that the universal standard we all share is the ultimate good that we strive for, but we don't always satisfy that. We don't always need it. For each of these in instincts, or you may think of them as impulses, are good in some circumstances and bad in others. The piano is a great example, right? Think of the keys of a piano. A, the piano, you say, well, innately, there is no right or wrong key, right? There are white keys or black keys. There's different letters. Until you play a song, there's one's not bad and one's not good. They're just keys. But think of the keys when you start to play a song. Any one key, if you pick one out, is right sometimes and is wrong at other times. What if the keys are like our, our instinct, our impulses? Sometimes when you're, as you're going through life, just like the keys on a piano, it's right to play that note at some times and it's wrong to play it at other times. But instead, our moral law, think of it as the music. It's the tune. It's what's written on the sheet music. The music, the tune, is what guides that pianist to play the right keys. It is the good. It is the ultimate good. But it guides what keys to press. Just like in our lives, the music, the music will help us know how we respond to our natural instincts. <laughs> Just as music rides above the notes, our moral law rides above our instincts. So that, that, that kind of focused on instincts. So I wanted to make clear that it can't be an instinct, our moral law. So another, whatever, what's another objection? Another common objection you'll hear is people say, right and wrong is just things that are taught to us. You know, we all are taught by our parents, motherly love, they come down and they teach you manners, and as a baby, you learn right and wrong. You learn that you shouldn't talk to your brother that way, that's not nice, you wouldn't want him to talk to you that way. And as a child, you grow up with being taught these things. Some people argue that, that you think it's innate, but really you just learned it from your mom. But that, I'm going to prove why that cannot be true. But it's kind of true. Right? We get manners. You know, we're taught manners by our, our parents. But here's the key. Just because we're taught good morals and good behavior doesn't make it less true. So a good example of that would be multiplication. We go to school as children. We learn multiplication. But whether we learned it or not doesn't make it true or not true. If we never learn multiplication, is multi the fact of multiplication in our world, would that be not true because we didn't learn it? It's still true. There's some basic physics and basic mathematics that are true whether I learned them or not. And I think morality is like that also. What are some things that we learn as children that wouldn't otherwise be true? So here, this is kind of like the way my engineering mind is. Well, let's think of the opposite. Let's just warp our mind backwards. What if you took the opposite? What are some examples? And feel free to blurt out things that you learn in your life that if you didn't learn them, they wouldn't be true. Or in other words, think of human convention. Things that we learn as a society together that's common in our society, say American society, that if we didn't teach it to each other, it wouldn't otherwise be innately true. Anybody have an example of that? The English system versus like the metric system? The, the English system versus, versus the metric system? Oh, oh, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, I didn't think about that one. That's a good one. Right, English versus the metric system. It's a human convention. That's true. What about it? The bro code. The bro code. <laughs> totally. Would not be, well, maybe it does exist. <laughs> <laughs> Any others? The, mathematical I think word. the idea of you can be anything you want to be. No. You, yeah. If you just try hard enough. If you just try hard enough. Language? Language. I think that I think that's a good one, right? Because you wouldn't necessarily know English if we didn't teach our children English. Eventually, we wouldn't know it. Well, one example I put up here would be: What about driving on the right side of the road? <laughs> Isn't that a good example? <laughs> we only do it because we all teach each other that, and we have laws about it. But if we met, if we just decided that we're not going to teach our children this anymore, you know, it wouldn't be universally true. It's a human convention, right? <laughs> just go to English. But let's, all right, let's try to apply this to the law of morality. What if, 
What if the rules of right and wrong were simply things taught to us, as some people argue? What if it was like driving on the right side of the road? What would be the implications of that? <coughs> well, for one, the morals of one country wouldn't be any better than another. Let's think about Nazi Germany again. When we look back on that, we, I think, legitimately object to the treatment of the Jews, right? But if our morality was something only taught to us, how could we object to it? Because we, someone could say, well, that's the way they were taught. The, the, the Germans at that time, they were taught by their parents that the Jews were subservient, that the Jews deserved to die. So by this argument, because they were taught these things, who am I to judge them? Who am I to say that that was immoral? Because what they were taught is moral because they were taught it. That's we all know that's absurd, right? So I think that destroys the argument that morality is just something taught to us. How could we judge the actions of another country? How could we judge the way women are treated in Saudi Arabia? How could we judge that if it was just something taught to us? Because how are our standards any better than their standards? If it's what they're taught over there, that's right for them. What we're taught here is right for us. How could we object? We all know that's absurd. Another one would be, well, okay, American morals in the 1930s would be no better than Nazi morals. Sure, let them kill all the Jews. They were taught it after all that it's okay. What should we do about it? Let them do it. It's crazy. It's absurd, right? Another good example would be civilized society morals would be no better than savage morals. So an example with that would be, I think, well, a Saudi Arabia might be a good one, but savage morals, you see sometimes... You see some uh, some societies that, that do horrible things to women, you know, or to their children, you know, and and even though we do share an innate sense of morality, if it was only something taught to us, who are we to object to that, right? Which is crazy. So unlike learning how to drive a car, our moral law would be a real thing, even if our parents didn't teach us man. It would still be in our hearts. So the big question is, well, we had this standard of right and wrong. You know, where did this come from? And notice I haven't really talked much about Jesus. Obviously, I love Jesus. He's Lord of my life. But what I'm focusing on right now in this presentation, at least in this beginning part, is a focus on the standard morality that we have and to show that the best explanation for the life that we observe is that there is a creator God. That there is, and that that person, that creator has a mind much like we have a mind, much more powerful than our minds. But that's the best explanation to fit the facts of reality. And we're going to talk about that, is that the best explanation is something for someone outside this physical universe. If we didn't learn it when we were schooled, if it's always transcends time, how did we get it if it didn't come from something outside of our reality, outside of our universe? If it's not an instinct, if it's not something taught to us, where else would, we have, would it have come from? Now, it's hard for us to imagine things outside of our universe and how that could instill, or that person could instill morality into creation. The idea of a cr an intelligent creator or a god fits the observable facts much better than other ideas about where it came from. Any biblical reference references for how or when we receive this moral law? I think we already talked about it. I think that we got it when God created us from His image and gave us so many attributes. That, are, that, he, that he shares with us, that we take for granted. So in conclusion about our moral standards, our rules of decent behavior or right conduct are, one, not the same as an instinct. The moral law will suppress some of our impulses at times, and it will encourage others. We talked about that. It's not a human convention or something that's simply taught to us. Our moral law is much more like mathematics in that they are constant and true, no matter how much mathematics training we may have. Realizing this truth means that we must accept that there is such thing as absolute right in this world. It exists as an overall standard by which we judge and compare different systems of morality, savage versus civilized societies, 
or Nazi versus American moralities. And from our experiences, we can learn some things about the character of this creator God, can't we? If he's the creator of morality, what characteristics of that God can we conclude based upon the discussion so far? Anybody want to But what we talked about so far, what are some characteristics about God that we can conclude? That it has a clear standard of right and wrong. It's a clear distinction from right and wrong. He owns absolute truth. He owns absolute truth. I don't think we talked about it, but I think um, that God is 100% good, so everything that he does is good. That, I think that is where I was going to answer another way, re, what place that we got moral law is that it comes from God's goodness. He can't not be good, so he can't not have a moral perfection. So God God is the <coughs> ultimate good. Yeah. That's good. It's also got the final word. God is also wise. Is it not? I mean, if you think about it, our moral law, does it not keep us together? You know, I mean, what would society be like without it? What if it was, what if our standard was based on evil? I mean, there would be chaos. Like I mentioned, earlier, we'd be fighting like animals. But the fact that the moral law, it, that it's used, it's in our hearts, and it's used for the basis of, of, of our legal laws, it, he's wise and knew that we, that, that, that this is the way, this is the way that his people and his kingdom are supposed to communicate, or how we're supposed to live our lives. So God is wise and concerning. God cares about our individual choices. This is the key. God is a personal God. If he wasn't a personal God, he wouldn't have instilled in us that voice that we all have when we're in that case where we ought to do A and not B, even when it's not, not what you want to do. That means he cares about our individual choices. Wow. God is a personal God. God is good. The standards that he gives us are always good. God is a good God. Isn't that cool? I mean, without even, if you think about it, without even really reading the Bible for the first time, you can perceive the characteristics of God just in your everyday human life. And doesn't this really describe the God of the Bible that we worship? Isn't that cool that even without the written word, you can perceive that God is good? I just think that's profound, that God's personal. A lot of people, especially throughout time, believe that God is very impersonal. That he is kind of, he, yeah, maybe there's a creator God, but he really doesn't grovel in our individual lives. But the evidence suggests the opposite. The evidence is that God cares about our individual choices. Wow, that distinguishes our Christian faith from a lot of other faiths in the world. I think that's significant. We know also from the evidence that God is eternal and unchangeable. Isn't our basic morality? It never changes with time. God is eternal. He doesn't change his mind. He's unchangeable. He's reliable. I, I think the, the piece that we forget there, though, it seems like God's more merciful at times than yeah. the sudden judgment that we might see in, in Scripture. I talk about that toward the very end. That's, that's a good point. All right, so the next section is what we are not. So we're going to talk about, and kind of continue on some of the objective arguments as well here, is that how are we different from things we observe in nature? And I'm going to talk a little bit about the role of science. And I'm going to even talk about creation just a little bit, although I don't emphasize creation. But what are we not? What makes us as humans different from the rest of creation? So I'm going to look at two things here. We've got two pictures. One is a waterfall and one is a sign right way and wrong way. When you think about things of nature, and I don't want this to confuse people, when I talk about laws of nature in this section, I'm really talking about laws of the physical nature of the world. But laws of nature is what nature in fact does. Observable facts. For example, water falling or a rock rolling down a hill. Observable facts of nature, they follow the physical laws of the universe. But laws of morality is different from the laws of our physical nature, of the physical nature. Laws of morality, morality are what human beings should do, and the key is it's unobservable. Laws of nature are observable facts. Laws of morality are for the most part unobservable because it's what's inside. What is that? 
you ought to do this. <laughs> Human beings have two natures, do we not? We have observable, we have an observable nature, which is the facts of how humans behave. You can observe how humans behave. But also the unobservable is the knowledge of how humans should behave. So one objection that people say is that, is that the moral law is really just a matter of convenience. And let me put this another way, because I know you've heard this argument before, but another way I've heard it said is that human beings have lived a long time, and as people, just due to evolution, mm -hmm. as people die and live, laws of morality have, have honed itself in our nature to, that would allow us to preserve ourselves. It's like it's what's allowed the human race to continue on for so long, and so it's innate. And it's a matter, when it gets down to it, a matter of convenience. What is convenient for me is moral. And I've heard this argument before. So an example in nature, let's take a hokey stone. Now a hokey stone that is the wrong size or the wrong shape for a building is inconvenient. But someone might also argue that, well, it just wasn't meant to be. You ever heard people say it? Well, it just wasn't meant to be. It just wasn't meant to be there. This rock. Throw it aside. It just was not its destiny. Right? It's kind of like that same argument, right? It just wasn't meant to be. It's not convenient. It's kind of similar to self-preservation, isn't it? Is that if something is right because it's convenient, it's in that sense, it's like self-preservation. It could be preserving your life or preserving your human race. Things that are right for us or things that tend to help us along in this life are things that are convenient. Any examples of moral decisions that are not convenient for us? <coughs> so here I am again, taking that, I'll make you flip your brain back around. What about, what examples of you know are good decisions that are just not convenient? That'd be actually pretty easy when you think about it. Saving the guy on the road. Saving the guy on the road, not very convenient. It's true. What about another one? Anybody? Loving your neighbor as yourself. Loving your neighbor yourself, usually not convenient. Not cheating on a test. So here's a good example. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing this dog is missing is a cup of coffee, and he'd just be perfect. So what if I go to church one Sunday morning, and I find a man occupying my favorite seat? Oh, don't do that. <laughs> don't occupy my seat. But... Let's say I walk in and say, man, well, that's not very convenient to me, right? But, one, but, that, but two scenarios could have happened. The first scenario would be that the man arrived at the chair before me. He got there before I did. Okay, that's plausible, right? But a second scenario might be the man slipped in the chair while my back was turned. So during the greeting, I'm shaking my hand, so I slips in my chair behind me, right? It's two ways that guy got there, right? Somebody else got his chair. <laughs> Maybe so. But, let's, but consider those two scenarios. Both scenarios are equally inconvenient to me. I lost my chair in both scenarios. But who am I going to be angry at? Am I going to be angry at the person who got there before me? Or am I going to be more angry at the person who slipped in while my back was turned? Slippage. That's an easy one, right? But isn't it interesting that I make that distinction as a human being, but yet I am equally inconvenienced by both scenarios? Why wouldn't I be angry at the first person? I think that hurts the argument that morality is a matter of convenience. So another good example is, let's say somebody, I'm walking in a crowded mall and somebody accidentally trips me and I fall to the ground. I'm unlikely to be very angry at that person. I'd probably say, I'm okay, no problem, no problem, right? I'm not gonna be mad at that person. It was an accident, right? But what if it was done on purpose? I'm going to be angry at that person. Somebody trips me on purpose in the mall, I fall down. Both scenarios, I fall to the ground. Aren't I equally inconvenienced? Both times I trip. But I'm only mad at the person who did it on purpose. I'm not mad at the person who did it by accident. Isn't that a good point? And what if I didn't actually trip? Now think about this. I love this one. If somebody trips me by accident, I'm not mad. But if somebody tries to trip me, and even if I don't fall, I'm still mad, even though I wasn't inconvenienced. 
I mean, that just, I think that's a powerful argument. So clearly, morality is not a matter of convenience. So in conclusion, all morality, it transcends things that are convenient to men. Alright, another reverse. <laughs> Let's take a reverse example. Sometimes there are things that are convenient to me and may be useful to me that are not right. Can you think of any examples of that? This is another example of how of it destroys this argument. If things that are convenient to me are not right, well, a lot, we probably all think of a lot of things like that, right? So one example is, I like this example of a traitor in wartime. Think about a traitor. So I may, in a war, if I'm a general, I may give money to a traitor and benefit greatly from that traitor, but I'm probably going to look at that person as almost scum. You think I'm going to invite that person over to my family's house for dinner? Only if I thought it was going to get me something. <laughs> but it has always been, if you look back at, at history of war, there's been traitors for a long time. And even by the people who benefit, they look at a traitor with very low regard, even though they benefit. That traitor was convenient to me, but I'm not going to like him. Traitors historically even consider human vermin was a phrase used in the Revolutionary War. The law of morality to our that. Finally, I get to creation. <laughs> how the universe got started. So there are lots of different theories about how the universe got started, but you could sum them up into two basic views. The first is called the materialist view. Sheer probability coupled with extraordinary time cause complex life forms to be created through completely random chemical processes. The opposite of that view is a creationist view. This universe was created by something more like a mind as far as we know. And this creator created complex creatures like itself and that we also have minds. Right? Now this is not necessarily the Christian God, right? This is just the creationist versus materialist view of creation. But the question is, how can we go about determining which view is correct? If we really wanted to dig deep, dig our heels in, and do our own self-study, how would you go about seeking that answer? Am I going to believe in a materialist view or a creationist view? What's, what's the best way to go about it? Well, one is you can use science, right? What is science? We cannot determine which view is correct by using science alone. So what are the limitations of science? Science is useful. I'm in a field of science myself. Very useful for us. But it has limitations. Anybody? Who wants to say, what are some limitations of science? In general. It's based on assumptions. It's based on assumptions. That's often true. Mm -hmm. Limited to what we can observe. It's limited to what we can observe. That's good. It has to be testable and reproducible. Testable and reproducible. That's good. That's good. Science works by experiments. It watches how things behave. So, for example, if I put a chemical in a pot and I heat it up to a certain temperature and I get some result, right? Good chemistry is an experiment. That's the basis for all science. But notice that science cannot answer the question of why anything comes to be there at all. You put something in a pot, but how did that get there? It can't answer that. It's impossible. It also can't tell you anything about what's behind what you observe in science. So what scientists do is they make observations, and then they repeat it, and they repeat it in different ways so that they can create a formula from it that represents what they observe. So all of your equations in your physics books and all that stuff is all based on observation, but they fit it. They fit the equations to fit reality so that they can be described or predicted. But really, science can't say anything about what's behind what they observe. It's just what they observe. If there is anything behind our observable world, it would not be revealed by science. So that begs the obvious question, 
if science provides real limits to our ability to observe the reality of a God or creator, what is a better way to study the realities of what is behind what we observe in the universe? Anybody have any ideas? If you can only go so far, and science is useful, I'm not saying it's not, it's very useful, but it will only get you so far. But if you really want to go the distance, if you really want to observe what is behind what we see in the universe, what do you go to next? If it's not science, you buy an idea? What's next? What, what are the other options? And this is the answer to this is really subtle. When I tell you, you're going to go like, oh yeah, of course. History? 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 It's true. History is wasn't quite the answer I was looking for, but it, certainly that's true. You got there's certain histories very helpful. And a biblical history is also, of course, a big part of that. What about observing ourselves? <laughs> is that just kind of like a duh kind of thing, right? But I want to emphasize, this is really, really significant. Because I want to point out something very important. That... The one thing that we know better than what we observe in the universe is, is ourselves, right? It is us. Can you ever thought about that? We observe everything else around us. But we have insider knowledge because we are man. We have insider knowledge, right? That's unique. I cannot, I can observe a rock, but I can't get inside that rock. I can observe man, I can observe people, but I can observe also what is in me to some extent. That's the one unique thing that man has, is the ability to observe himself. We don't just observe man, we are man or women. I have no um, thing about man here, it's just it was easier to type man. <laughs> <laughs> what is the thing that we know? As we talked about before, we know that there is a moral law within, all, within us that we don't always follow but we know that we ought to follow it. We can't say that about any other thing in the world, but we can say it about ourselves, because we all experience that. If there was a controlling power behind the universe, it could not show itself, or is unlikely to show itself, to us as objects inside the universe. Think about a stairway. I love this stairway. It's just crazy. It's like floating in air, it looks like. But... I can observe this as a creation, but it doesn't tell me much about the architect. Sure, I can sense his mind as far as what style he likes, but I can argue that I could go to 50 houses this architect built stairs in, I could get up to it, make measurements, observe it, but I, I, can t I could argue I would learn more about the man with a 30-minute conversation. I could talk to him for 30 minutes and learn way more about that architect than I would be by studying his work. And I think that's a good analogy, that we can look at the world around us and we get a sense of God and His power. But I think that in ourselves, in studying ourselves and studying our relationship with God, we'll learn more about the Creator than we would be by observing His hand. Hmm. Since we, of course, we're also in the universe. Since we are in the universe, the only place that we could find this evidence of a controlling power would be within ourselves. How, does that, how do we observe ourselves? Well, it's a voice or a feeling inside of us that tells us to behave in a certain way. This is exactly what we all experience. Have you ever sensed an inner voice or urge to do right, even when you don't want to do it? We all have, right? But, of course, observing man has limits also. Observing man, first of all, from the outside, observing what a man does, doesn't provide much evidence of the moral law within man. We can observe what people do, but really we can't always know what they're feeling, what their urges are in their body, but we can experience it within our own self, in our own lives. Observations reveal what we did. Moral law is what we ought to do. Similarly, there is... If there is anything above and beyond, behind the observable facts of our universe, 
we have no hope to ever discover it by observation only. The only way we can observe something behind creation is in ourselves, and it starts with a command or a feeling of how we ought to behave or what we ought to do. And I feel, I, you know, I, I believe God calls us into faith with Him, but I think that oftentimes that call that God puts in us is, is, is a lot of what I'm talking about here. It's that feeling, that voice in us, or that desire to seek Him. But I think it starts with something God implants in every one of us, to seek Him. That makes us unique among creation. We were made in His image, but I think He put a limit to us that we don't get full satisfaction without Him. But I think it starts with something inside. It's hard to describe. Some people call it a voice. Some people call it an emptiness. Some people call it, I'm missing something in my life, which was the case for me. But He calls people different ways. Everybody has a unique story. But I think it starts with something deep inside. God calls us. So having said all of that, how does all of this topic, this discussion, how can I tie this into the Christian message? We talked about a creator God. We talked about a shared sense of morality. A lot of things that really point to, you know, the message that we've had so far is simply this. The best, the best, um, the best excuse, or I should say, the best explanation for the evidence that we sense in our lives is really a creator God. But we haven't gone yet so far as the Christian God. We haven't talked about Jesus. How can we tie that in? And that's what I want to try to do in this last, this is the final section. Observable characteristics of God. So as we observe the universe, and when I say this, what I mean is the <coughs> physical universe. I love this picture, by the way. Is awesome. This is that, I forget what it's called, but it's the uh, seahorse uh, yeah, nebula. Nebula, thank you. Yeah, this is incredibly beautiful. Uh, but as we observe the universe, what are some characteristics about God, even if we don't look at man? Well, certainly we could say he's a great artist, for the universe is a very beautiful place. Great handiwork, great artist. We could also say that he is powerful and can be quite terrifying to humans because the universe is a dangerous place. We, we just simply wouldn't survive in 99.999999% of the universe. We just wouldn't survive. The universe is dangerous to humans. So we can conclude, simply looking at the facts, God is powerful and can be terrifying to humans. <laughs> But what about when we observe within us our insider information, which is really the best source, I think. What is it that we can observe? What are the characteristics of God that we can observe from within ourselves? Well, first, we can, we can observe that He cares deeply about right conduct. That we must conclude that God is good. And it's hard to conclude that if we didn't have our own experiences. If we didn't have that and just looked at the physical universe, it's hard to conclude that, but we know God is good. But God is not good in a soft, squishy sense. Right? It's easy to think of God as soft and easy. He encourages us to do good, no matter how painful or difficult that may be. So being good is not always fun. But God expects us to be good. So he's good, but that's not always convenient, right? So we're in a, really a situation of hopelessness when you really think about it, right? If God is absolute goodness, then he must hate much of what we do. If he is good all the time, and we all know that we violate our innate sense of morality, then he must hate much of what we do. This puts us into a position of hopelessness either way we look at things, right? On one hand, we, if the universe is not governed by absolute goodness, goodness, then our situation is ultimately hopeless. You know, after all, what is there to look forward to? If there is no creator God, if there is no absolute goodness, we are hopeless. We have absolutely no future <coughs> and nothing to look forward to. How depressing is that? 
On the other hand, if it is as we, as I hope most people in this room believe, if the universe is governed by absolute goodness, well guess what? It's still hopeless, right? Because we rebel against and we make ourselves enemies to him every day. So even, so whether God is real and good or whether he's not, in either case, at the most basic level, we are hopeless, right? God is our only comfort, but he is also our supreme terror. Right? I mean, he's powerful. We made ourselves enemies of God when he is our only possible ally. Just in how we live our life. He is our only hope, our only ally, but every day we make ourselves enemies of God. But God has thrown us a lifeline, and this is what makes Christianity unique, is that God recognizes our hopelessness, and he throws us a lifeline. He has offered us a way out. And I want to emphasize one thing. The Christian faith, it starts with the acknowledgement of our hopelessness. Christian faith should not start with the sense of all is well, right? It should not. It should start with the sense and the recognition of our hopelessness before an all-powerful God that is good, that is right, and a, and a recognition that we are inadequate by ourselves to live up to that standard. So it starts with really a sense of fear. But the ultimate, once you've accepted the Christ, the Christian message, it is a life of unspeakable hope and joy. But it must start in darkness. It must start with a sense of hopelessness. God has thrown us a lifeline. He's offered us a way out. The faith starts with a realization that we fall short, we fall short of a perfectly good God that our situation is hopeless. It starts with the realization of the painful truth that we are helpless before an uncompromising God. But the Christian message is one that offers us a way out of this hopelessness. It explains how God intervened in His creation by sending His Son, Jesus, to take all of our sins with Him when He died on the cross. So where we are guilty of sin, where we are guilty of violating God's just laws, that sense of morality we know is always good. God took that and took it from us and put it on His Son on the cross. That was the payment. And the Christian message is unique to that extent. It, that is the lifeline that God has thrown to us. Jesus suffered and paid the price for our sin. As a result, we are offered God's forgiveness for our sins which gives us eternal life where God will never leave us or forsake us. It's the only way out. It's the only way out of our hopelessness. But His promises are amazing. Because He takes the sin from us, now we can commune with God forever. God will never leave us. He is our ultimate comfort. And, we, and the key is that we have peace. And it's easy, and I think... I've heard this a long time, to think of peace as kind of this squishy thing, right? But really, what is peace? Peace can be a good feeling in our hearts. Peace, really at its core, is, is not being condemned by God. We have peace with God. In a way, like a nation will have peace with another nation, but they don't have war anymore. You know, we have peace, it means that before an ultimate good God, an uncompromising God, he no, longer, he no longer condemns us that we are at peace with Him. What an amazing sense of comfort that carries with it in our hearts. And it, it creates a sense of comfort and joy. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. The Christian faith is unique in that it offers us a life of unspeakable comfort where we are at peace with God, who is almighty, powerful, uncompromising and loving. How do we know He's loving? Because He did it, right? The fact that He loves us, He sent His Son to die for us, what is a greater love than that? We know that He loves us. 
Come to know the true God of creation. He is offering himself to anyone who asks for his forgiveness. All we have to do is just ask. And he wants a relationship with you which will transform your life. Thank you. And that's the end.